This is Bible Academy. We are in 1 John chapter 3. Now before we get started, as always, let's make sure that we have confessed our known sins and that we are allowing the Spirit of God to control us. Let's pray. Well, Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this opportunity and privilege, everything you've provided so that we can study your word. We ask that our hearts and minds be open and ready to receive your truth. In Jesus' name, amen. By way of review, let's read over the verses we studied last time and do a summation. 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. See what sort of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called the children of God, and indeed we are. For this reason the world does not know us, because it did not know Him. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we will be. We know that when he appears, we will be like him because we will see him just as he is. And everyone who has this hope focused on him purifies himself just as he is pure. We see here the believer is called a child of God. We are fathered. We are born of God the Father. The moment we believed in Jesus Christ, we not only entered the family of God, but take on some of the characteristics of our Father. We are changed on the inside. We have a new life. Now, the world doesn't understand this change. The world does not understand why you do not do the things you used to do. It does not know us because it does not know him. Though we are children of God, we do not yet know what we will be. By that, we mean Scripture does tell us of a new transformed or resurrection body and that we will be like him in some ways. But there's also an inner change that goes on right now within us. When all that comes together at Christ's next revealing, well, we just don't know how all these things will come together for life in the kingdom of God and eternity. And we turn to the Lord in faith initially. It was as if a veil was removed. And we began to see God. We began to see the glory of the Lord as a reflection, as if in a mirror. At the same time, we are being transformed into the image we see of Christ. So seeing the Lord has an effect of changing our lives. His glory becomes reflected through us. This ongoing transformation that takes place as we grow spiritually, as we change from glory to glory, now this focus upon Christ charges us to purify ourselves as he is pure. In the next section, John gives us the contrasting lifestyles of believers and unbelievers. Now, the contrast is very basic. He doesn't get into detail. He doesn't mention what uh, believers should be doing all the time or unbelievers should be doing all the time other than something very general and it has to do with how one practices or does not practice sin in his life. Now before we look at the next several verses, actually the next seven verses, 
put it more precisely. I want us to look at some interpretive rules here. Now what I mean by that is because we read and interpret English differently than what the Greek says, sometimes when people translate the Greek in our English translations, it can be misleading. It's not intended to be, but they're basically just telling you what the Greek says without analyzing it deeper. I mean, these are these are translations. They're not, uh, and and all translations are are to some degree interpretive. Don't 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 forget that. But what we're going to see is is the tendency of the Greek and understanding of the Greek, which I know if you don't know Greek, this is going to be uh, uh, not fully understood, but I'm going to try to explain this to you, and perhaps I should just get started. The present tense in English and Greek can both mean continuous action. So let me just give you but I'm just going to do this freehand on the board. Uh, there's something that's going on and on and on and on and on. We can call that linear action, continuous action. Grammar books sometimes call it progressive. It's going on, okay? Now, when you analyze the, uh, the Greek text and you see a present tense actually this present tense this progressive action can be taken in different ways and I'm going to give you some samples um, it can be at the beginning so you see something start and it continues up to a point it can be habitual it happens here and here and here, but it keeps it keeps happening, right? Um, it began in the past, and it continues up to now. That would be this starting here, continues up to now. And the and the Greek has other ways to explain progressive action, but the main idea is it's something that's going on and on. Now, the translations that we see in 1 John are often very simple. They don't explain or expand on any of these sub-meanings, we might say. Plus, one has to consider the verb. And the verb may also direct us which one of these types of progressive actions are we talking about. Now, I'm not going to get a lot of detail here, but I just want to get you an idea of where people can easily get off if they don't properly understand which present tense the Greek is referring to. Now, let's take the uh, habitual action, okay, in present time. Um, we would use that as, uh, what I'm translating it is, as the word practicing. So if I was saying that you are practicing sin, that doesn't mean every possible second is filled with sin, filled with sin. It means that this is basically a way of life. So that's kind of like the habitual. You do it here, you do it here, you do it here, you do it here, you do it here. Okay? Over a period of time. We call that a lifestyle. Or way of life and that is how John often uses it in the next several verses we're looking at he's talking about a lifestyle all right the action is constant and it's enough to see that it is regularly going on in that person's life or our own life now as English speakers we have a tendency to read some of these sentences in English, and unfortunately I think some of the translations reinforce that, so you really try to keep it simple. 
but it leads to misunderstanding. We also tend to think in terms of absolutes and sometimes speak that way when we really don't mean it. Uh, if I was to say uh, uh, about, a, let's say, a person who's really thin, and they might ask me, uh, because I know them, they say, well, why are they so thin? I, would, I could say something like, well, they don't eat. Now, you know I don't mean they never eat. But the impression upon me is they don't eat very much or eat very often. So I say, well, they just don't eat. Or you might say the opposite side. You say, they're always eating. Okay? Uh, so that's the kind of things we got to see here. We got to see what does John really mean behind some of these phrases that appear to be absolute. So we translators and interpreters have some explaining to do. That's what I'm trying to do now. Now we have just looked at the believer who purifies himself. That was a present tense. Does that mean he's always purifying himself? Or does he do it now and then? Or when the need arises? Well, it says he purifies himself. So we take that particular verb with a particular tense and we try to sort out and choose exactly what John is mean, means. And I don't think we have a hard time understanding it. He purifies himself. When the need arises, he, when he's tempted uh, or he sees a habit he needs to get rid of, he gets rid of it. That's the idea behind it. Uh, when he sees the need, that means he may see himself with an opportunity, a uh, temptation to sin. He doesn't do it. That's an act of purifying himself. Or he may deliberately get out of something or stop something or um, he uh, gets rid of a habit. He purifies himself. Now, this does it mean that he's perfect. It doesn't mean that he doesn't now and then get into temptation. My goodness, John has taught us about this over and over. In fact, he gave some guidelines at the very beginning about the importance of confession. So we know that even a believer who purifies himself will now and then sin. And of course, the less the better. But clearly understand, and I've taught this many times, as long as you have this human body, you're going to sin. Now, we're not supposed to take the attitude, well, if I'm going to sin, I might as well sin. No, that's not what we're supposed to do either. But on the other hand, when you do sin, you make sure you confess it. Now, we're going to see here that God doesn't like sin. And we know that. After all, he sent his son to die in our place for the inevitable penalty of sin. Now, in the following verses, we're going to see John contrast, as I said at the heading, the contrast uh, of lives, lifestyles of believers and unbelievers. That's in verses 4 through 10. Now, when it comes to verse 4, which is next, John contrasts verse 4 with something, what we, something of what we saw in verse 3. And I just mentioned it, actually, the believer who purifies himself. All right. Now, he talks about the other side as he introduces this section on contrasting lifestyles. First, we look at the unbeliever in verse 4. This is coming off a contrast from the one who purifies himself in verse 3. Here it is. Everyone who practices sin also practices lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. Well, obviously, John is bringing in the principle that uh, sin is related to lawlessness. Uh, who practices sin? Present active participle of the word. Poieto. Let's go ahead and look at that word now and get it out of the way because we're going to see it again. It means to make, 
do, produce, bring about, or cause. All right, or cause. So, it's something that is uh, involved in the action of doing something. Just keep it that simple. Now, you notice that I translated it, practices sin. I didn't translate it, the one who sins, or the one who does sin, but who practices sin. And the idea is, I want you to see this as a lifestyle. And what about lawlessness? Well, <clears throat> from other studies, we know how the Jews viewed lawlessness. That was breaking the Mosaic Law. That would be sin to them. But that's not the issue here. We're not talking about the Mosaic Law, per se. However, now, and in John's mind, lawlessness is more of an attitude. And what do I mean by that? It's an attitude that comes with a lifestyle. A lifestyle that <clears throat> um, is um, often characterized by sin. In other words, lawlessness <clears throat> is a basic rebellion against God. Like I said, it's an attitude. We see that in the life of the Antichrist. We see that with the false teachers. Of course, the Antichrist comes off of, you know, his, his origin is basically Satan. And he's basically going to be a, a sinner from the beginning, just like the Antichrist, I mean, just like Satan. Now, the Antichrist, or the false teachers, uh, what have we seen of them? They're out to discredit John, uh, to teach heresy to deceive believers. And most of all, they oppose God. That is a rebellious heart. That's a rebellious person. Now, keep that thought in mind, and we look at the last line of verse 4, I might say the last phrase, and sin is lawlessness. So, the one who practices sin is practicing lawlessness. And, he's, and we see here that the sin he's talking about is basically a rebellion against God. Now, let's take this point that we just saw in this verse 4 and put it by points with the, with the three previous verses. Now we're going somewhere here, so listen to these six points. I'll put them on the board. <clears throat> One, we are loved by God in that we are children of God. Two, the world does not know us. Three, when Christ appears, we'll be like him in resurrection body, but without nail-scarred hands or feet. I thought I would put that in there because we haven't heard that much. Four, we will be righteous as he is righteous. Five, all this should motivate us to purify our lives, which is reflected in our lifestyle. That brings us up to our verse, and now our verse. In contrast is the unbeliever who lives a lifestyle of sin and rebellion against God. Don't ever lose the biblical viewpoint of the unbeliever. He's in rebellion against God. As nice as he might be, as, as much religious as he could be, he's still in rebellion against God if he's an unbeliever. In verse 5, John brings in another reason that we should not be sinning. He just said sin's lawlessness. We have no business getting involved in that kind of rebellion against God. But in verse 5, he brings in another very important reason for not sinning. And that's because Christ opposes it. Christ opposes it. Verse 5. 
you know that he was revealed in order to take away sins. And in him there is no sin. Obviously, this is talking about Christ. First phrase, you know that he was revealed in order to take away sin. This was the purpose of the first revelation of Jesus Christ. He was to go to the cross and pay for the sins of the world. So Jesus is seriously opposed to sin, so much so that he staked his life against it as the God-man. We as believers should also be against it. Now the next line makes a point about Jesus who did this. And in him there is no sin. Jesus avoided sin and did not disobey God one little bit. There was not a speck of rebellion in Jesus against the Father. If you studied the Gospel of John, you saw how much Jesus submitted to the Father to the point that basically they acted as one. So what we see here in verse 5, <clears throat> Jesus died for our sin and did not sin. That's a twofold reason we should not sin. Neither did Jesus rebel in any way against the Father as he lived the obedient life. So should we. Even though we can sin and find forgiveness through confession, we should remember that it displeases God and that the Son died to take the penalty away from us. Let me make this point clearly. Sin is not to ever be taken lightly. In verse 6, John brings the one who abides back into the picture. So he's going to bring the other side in, the believer. So we're coming back with the believer this time, obviously in contrast to the unbeliever in the previous verse. In verse 6 he says, <clears throat> Everyone who abides in him does not sin as a lifestyle. I put that in for clarification. Everyone who sins as a lifestyle has not seen him or known him. So he goes back to the believer, then he comes back to the unbeliever again. And of course he uh, keeps flipping back and forth, showing indicators of the believer as opposed to the unbeliever. Now the last half of the verse expands the idea of knowing with the metaphor of seeing him. Again, this is a way of evaluating our so ourselves and others. We look at their lifestyle. Uh, let me just throw this in. I think I'll mention this later on from the notes. But <clears throat> those people who run around saying, well, you're not supposed to judge, they don't know the scripture. We are constantly to be judging ourselves, our lifestyles, evaluating things and people around us. Uh, they quote Jesus out of context. They need to go back and read the context. You don't, you don't judge to condemn. That's God's prerogative. But we must be constantly judging and evaluating things around us to make good choices, to make good companions, to make friends, to make sound decisions. Now, lifestyle is an indicator of who one follows, who one's allegiance is to, and whether one is a believer or not. <clears throat> Look at the lifestyle. Look at your own lifestyle first. Uh, one of the teachings about judging is don't be a hypocrite about it. That was the thing about why are you judging them for a speck in their eye when you've got a telephone pole in yours. All right? Let's note the contrast here of lifestyle. I'm going <clears> to... <throat> 
put these phrases on the board. I attempted to write them, but let's look at them this way. We're talking about lifestyle. Everyone who abides in him, that's your spiritual life. This is a spiritual person. This is the one who is in fellowship, who is in the light, who is experiencing the love of God, is being perfected in his life. <clears throat> He's walking in truth and so on. He does not sin. It's not characteristic of his life to sin. And just to throw in some practicality, he does, he's not one who has a tendency to cheat or lie or use filthy language or tell dirty jokes or do things uh, in his uh, actions that are sinful. He watches his tongue. He, as people can't always tell, he attempts to keep his mind pure. On the other hand, everyone who sins, his spiritual life is this. He has not seen him or known him. He has no experience knowing God. Now, these are general rules for spiritual discernment. Now some may be asking, didn't you teach that believers sin and that's why we're to confess it? Yes. But what John is doing here, he's showing how it comes out in real life in one's lifestyle. He brings out a contrast between believers and unbelievers to make his point. <clears throat> Let me say this about perhaps some of you who were saved when you were very young. And I would think if you're very old now, you would know this. But let me just remind you of this. Because we are around people who have never been saved. And they are full-blown experiencing their sinful nature. Following the lust of the world, the lust of the flesh, the best they can. That's what drives them in life. That's what drives them to work hard so they can have money, so they can play hard or gather things. Their focus is upon the world and what the world can provide for them, both in pleasure and in possessions and so on. Now let's suppose that you were saved when you were under six years old. You never really experienced years of a life full of sin. By that I mean an adult able and free to fulfill some of those lust and worldly desires. You were dominated for a short time, but it was small stuff. Uh, and But to you it would have been big, but you didn't really give it much thought probably when you were four or five years old. There's a toy you had to have. You were lusting for something. Or you throw an angry fit. You want to go to that place. You want that thing on the shelf. You may have lied to avoid getting into trouble. Now if you were saved young uh, and you had Christian parents who were living the Christian lifestyle, there was a uh, additional restraint. But if you were saved young, you also had the Spirit. Still do. And so there was not only an, a spiritual restraint on you, but if your parents were good Christians, then there was more restraint. They helped protect you from things they knew were sin or uh, evil traps. And as you got older, your parents would wise parents would carefully measure what restraint they gave you. So as a young child saved, you never experienced what it was to be dominated by sin as an adult and experience what so many do and often commit life-altering sins. These are the people Paul often addresses. 
those who were saved as they were adults. So they remember clearly when they used to follow idols, when they in rebellion against God, when they used to be involved in sexual sin and drunkenness and perhaps involved in uh, some of the uh, cultic religions or maybe just the do-gooder religion. Now John here is contrasting adult lifestyles. Let's make that clear. There are those who do these things and there's who do those who do those things. Um, now let me get to that part about judging. People people often quip about not to judge. This is usually taken out of context from the scripture and misapplied. We are to be constantly judging and evaluating people. Now, there's good reason for that. I mean, that's not how you spend your time all the time, but when you get into a situation where you have to evaluate someone, I mean, you do that if you're in the business, if you're a teacher, in other professions, as a coach. But here we're talking about evaluating other people's lifestyle. So here we have a stern warning. When we see someone teaching or claiming to teach the scripture and their lifestyle does not fit, watch out. Now, I will tell you this. Teachers aren't perfect either, and they have their weaknesses. I'm talking about Bible teachers, and they may have their time where they go into a, a spiritual uh, dive I have a tendency to say that all teachers have done it. I've done my share. But you ask yourself, how does how they live match up with Scripture on the pure life? This is why Paul warns not to have two new converts as teachers. Uh, that is a target for Satan. He loves to get new converts who want to be teachers and get in their hearts and minds, build up their pride, and set them up to teach his stuff. Well, our point from this passage is that as Christians, we are to have discernment. We have values. We have standards. We have a higher love for people in general. And it isn't phony. We're not playing the games. If you want to really help someone, one of your primary concerns is, are they saved? What do they think of Christ? Now, the question is here, in this context, what do we see in the life of others? If there is constant sin, then it is only proper that we should view them as someone who does not know Christ, does not know God. They've never seen him in the sense of spiritually seen him. They don't know him. They have no relationship with God. One of my opening lines in the past when I want to witness to someone is, Do you know the Lord? And because I, well, I should say, I don't say this very often I just don't spout it out. I evaluate the situation in the person and then depending upon his response we go from there. But knowledge of God, knowledge of the Lord implies some sort of relationship. Teachers who have a sinful lifestyle that includes uh, one full of greed those are inclined toward the prosperity movement. It's a strong warning that their teaching is false. Well, this brings us to John's next warning, which is more the same. And we can see again that John is keeping it simple, keeping it straight, doing repetition to get these believers who have drifted away back into the fold. Verse 7, 1 John 3, 7. 
Dear children, let no one deceive you. The one who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he, referring to Christ, is righteous. Now, could it be any more simpler than that? He uses the opening, dear children, his words of endearment. Let no one deceive you. This is the imperative, the command. Don't be deceived. And here's the basic truth. The one who practices righteousness is righteous. There's a word for practice. Poieo again. This time is the present participle. To make, to do, to produce. And then the high standard. Just as he, Christ, is righteous. It may be that some of the false teachings were that one could attain some special level or enter some sphere or circle of the righteous. So here, again, John might be taking some of the false teaching, their concepts, and attaching scriptural meaning to them. Uh, as someone says, oh, we belong to the righteous. And you know that's a cult. And with that, they all say, we're the ones who have truth. Well, they redefine truth also. We're the ones who follow God. Or we're the children of God. And you start inquiring to what they mean by that. It's not the biblical definition of following Christ or children of God. John would have none of that. The righteous person is evaluated by his way of life. He lives righteously according to the standard of Jesus Christ or he does not. The believer who is righteous naturally practices righteousness. This is the way he acts. This is the way he lives. To ignore that or adopt some other teaching that works around this basic truth is deception. And that's why he says that no one deceive you. If they're truly righteous, they'll live righteous according to the scripture. Not redefine righteousness, have it a special righteousness in their own little way. One of the difficult challenges about getting people out of cults is how they redefine almost every word uh, that you use as a Christian into their own definition. You see this among the charismatics when it comes to words like anointing, which we saw recently, or even understanding how the Spirit indwells the believer. They also redefine terms like tongues. And they're just plain wrong. But people who don't know better often fall into that trap. Or they're, they're ignorant of Scripture and they find someone who appeals to their lust and they throw in words that they think might be scriptural. And this is how false teachers draw people in. There's no better protection than learning and growing in the Word of God and living in the power of the Holy Spirit to protect you from cults. Plain and simple, righteous people live righteously. Verse 8. The one who practices sin is of the devil because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. For this reason, the Son of God appeared so that he might destroy the works of the devil. Well, now the devil gets involved. Now, uh, this is strong stuff. I think John intended it to be. Uh, you, uh, if your group is loose on sin, let's just understand. The ones who are loose on sin, who practice sin, 
they're of the devil. They belong to the devil. You may recall if you studied John or if you just know the passage, it's well known. Jesus confronted the religious Jews and said their father was the devil. They have the desires of the devil. They do the works of the devil. John is viewing this as not any different than that. The one who practices sin, same phrase we've been saying, the one who practices, let's just contrast the two right quick. Back in verse 7, the one who practices righteousness is righteous. This one, he says, the one who practices sin is of the devil. In both cases, we're looking at the individual here. He's looking, let's look at the individual, okay? One lifestyle, one's lifestyle is defined by what he does. Living and doing righteously or living and doing sins. Now, when he says they're of the devil, well, that's, like I said, pretty strong stuff. But in a sense, and folks, listen to me, because I want you to get the impression I think that John's trying to put across. They really are of Satan. That means they belong to him. They reflect the character of their father. So, to look at it one, from one viewpoint, there you are, a child of God in the midst of children of the devil. These are John's words. The one who practices sin is of the devil. And then he talks about the devil when he says, because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. Let me just put the verse back up there again. The one who practices sin is of the devil, because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. I think even as Christians we have a tendency not to talk this way. But it's true. The unbelieving world is of the devil. Period. <laughs> now, this phrase, because of sin, because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. This is a way, uh, a way of saying from the beginning of the fall, his fall, long before the recreation of the earth. This is what he does. This is what he did. This is who he is. He wants his followers to be like him. Just like he picked up a third of the angels. He wants to pick up as much of mankind as possible to build his case against God. He wants his followers to rebel against God, to sin, to do evil. Now, we probably wouldn't put it this way if we were just going to tell somebody what John is saying. We would probably not say it this way as John wrote in our, if we were to write it in our everyday English vernacular. We would probably put it something like this. The devil has been in rebellion against God and sinning for thousands of years. So those who live a lifestyle of sin today show that they are his followers that they model him and their life as if they came from him. Now, the verse goes on to say, the second part begins on the end of the second line, For this reason the Son of God appeared, so that he might destroy the works of the devil. Don't ever miss that point. For this reason, the Son of God appeared so that he might destroy the works of the devil. And let me say, that's exactly what he did. Let's talk about the word destroy. For a moment, the aorist active subjuncting. He might destroy. That's a good translation. It's of the word luo. Basically, luo means to loose. He loosed. It has other meanings to destroy by violence, to bring to an end. And that's what we're talking about here. He brought it to an end. 
let's talk about the devil for a moment. We know that the devil was instrumental in the fall of mankind. He developed his cosmos diabolicus with all its interlocking systems of evil. Let's, put, let's just put down some of these. The fall of man. I'm going to keep it in black. Reminds you of death. Fall of man. He was involved in the fall of man, which led to cursing of the earth and other things. Uh, the penalty behind what the woman receives. He developed the cosmos diabolicus. That interlocking system of evil, I'll portray it like this, where these systems interlock to appeal to our lust. This is the way he controls the unbelievers. So he controls unbelievers. Did you get that? He controls unbelievers by getting their sin nature, all right, their sin nature to hook into his system. So there you got someone caught up in a corrupt business, corrupt entertainment, uh, corrupt social life, and so on. He also blinds <clears throat> unbelievers from truth. Truth of the gospel. Truth about God. That there is a God. Something of who God is so you don't reach out towards God. They make him something else. Or they might say there is no God. Or who knows. He has multiple ways to try and keep people from being saved. And he attacks the believer. As we see in this passage. Through false teachers, false teaching. Appealing to their lust. Appealing to their uh, uh, desires in this world. Better house, better car, better life, better job, better mate. Towards the end of this age, his plan is to raise up an Antichrist, and then we have him doing uh, world domination. World dominance. And then Christ comes back and destroys it all. There's our verse. He'll come back and finish this off at the end. All right? He'll also get rid of Satan. Christ work. Uh, let me put it this way. Christ started the destruction when he came to earth the first time. When Christ came to the earth, he went to the cross and he resurrected. How does it affect some of these things? Well, he brought salvation to fallen man. Let's do this. He brought salvation. Cosmos Diabolicus. Well, when the Lord came, he started breaking into this with his way of life, his kingdom power, and his miracles. So that you can begin to see that Satan does not dominate the world anymore. God always had overall control, but Satan ran loose for a long time. But God also had his Holy Spirit here to control so man wouldn't destroy himself. God sometimes implemented major judgments to keep man from destroying himself, as we see at the Genesis flood. I mean, not the Genesis flood, but the Noah flood. The Noahic flood. He wasn't going to let Satan destroy the human race. And he's not going to let, he's not going to let mankind destroy himself either right now. So, so much for 
some sort of nuclear war that wipes out the human race. That's nonsense. Or, or a meteor uh, destroying the earth. Uh, that's nonsense. That won't happen. God's in control of those things. Well, Jesus showed his dominance when he came and started breaking in with the kingdom of God and with power. And so we see here, I'm just going to put it this way, kingdom of God came in, started to break this to pieces, showed that God's kingdom could come right in. And as soon as that happens, uh, the diminishing of the cosmos, diabolic, diabolica, started to happen. It started to show its cracks. Right away, signs of Satan's kingdom ended uh, when Jesus did not give in to Satan's temptations after the wilderness. And when he did miracles, where he cast out demons, when he healed sick, of course, casting out demons showed Jesus more powerful than the most powerful team of demons. He healed the sick and, and cured diseases. He was uh, more powerful than the results of sin. He raised the dead. The ultimate penalty of sin is physical death. On earth, that is. Jesus, in addition, the other side, he lived without sin. He brought life. Uh, he opened the eyes. He brought light. He defeated the dominance of the sin nature by giving people life and then adding the Holy Spirit. He brought life, he brought light, he brought truth. So you have the Holy Spirit and you have truth. So he led to the Father men to be saved. Through him he saved mankind. He provided the path following the Father's plan. And then he overcame death. He overcame death. I didn't list death, but that's certainly one of them. But that's a result of sin. Indirectly, a result of Satan's cause to help man fall. Christ overcame death by resurrection. I should probably write those in. So, death from sin overcame by resurrection. What about the Antichrist? Oh yeah, well, we know what happens to him. He gets an early ticket to the lake of fire. We see this at the end of the tribulation our Armageddon campaign. And then of course Satan himself gets tossed in the lake of fire where his demons will be uh, warming up for him. Now, Cosmos Diabolicus showed cracks when Jesus came. Not only did Jesus not submit to Satan, but Satan could not stop the disciples from advancing the New Covenant Church, Matthew 16, 18. So now we have, I really don't have room in here, but we have the New Covenant Church and us. How's that? Believers today. We carry on the mission of Christ. We build up the church through our spiritual gifts and our obedience. But on the other hand, and we'll see this later in chapter 5, remember the world is still through God's permission and Satan's power. He still has his cosmos diabolicus. He still controls unbelievers. He still blinds them from truth. He still attacks believers. He still brings his antichrist. That's all still going to happen. People still die. But when Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil, they're going to go down. 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 
death is conquered, Satan himself is conquered. Satan will be imprisoned for a thousand years during the first phase of the kingdom of God on earth. We call that the millennium. While Christ himself rules the earth, it will be free from Satan. It won't be free from sin. Satan will be allowed out once again for a short time to show his rebellious stuff and reveal, we will see revealed, not necessarily his intention, but we will see revealed those who are in rebellion against God. They'll team up with Satan. They'll have rebellion against Christ. They'll attack Jerusalem. Jesus will instantly defeat them, and they're tossed into the lake of fire. Revelation 20.10. Well, I was going to continue on to verse 9, but it is very long, and I'm just going to wait, and we'll pick up there next time. Let's pray. Well, Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your word. We thank you for the challenges you've given us today. We ask that your spirit will make this clear in our hearts and minds that we might believe it and start making the practical application uh, of discernment regarding lifestyles and teaching false teachers so that we might continue to grow from glory to glory. In Jesus' name, amen.